Hello Constitutional Law class, welcome to the review for week one. So during this past week we spent a lot of time talking about the judicial function and how that affects our ideas about constitutional governance. We spent some time talking about Marbury v. Madison which establishes the basic principle of judicial review. And we talked a bit about what that principle means, how it fits into a constitutional system and the rule of law, and some of the controversies surrounding it. We noted Cooper v. Aaron, which was a kind of civil rights era high watermark of the notion of judicial review and how the court at that time uh, thought that judicial review was really important to constitutional governance and to the way that the different branches of government interface with the, the people, with the population. Uh, but we also noted ongoing controversies where pretty much everyone agrees that there's some principle of judicial review, exactly what that principle is or how far it extends remains a matter of significant debate. We then talked about the case or controversy requirement and as we discussed, Article 3 limits the judicial function to cases or controversies. And this reflects a judgment that the court should be involved in, in particularized uh, decision making, in particular disputes, not in just abstract policy questions. And we talked about a few ways in which that idea is, is fleshed out in our policy and doctrine. One of those ways is the general policy against advisory opinions. And as we noted, this is something that goes all the way back to uh, the time of George Washington and has been a, a principle that's Im embedded in the way our, our courts think about what they do ever since. And the idea here is that the court is not going to simply give advice to the other branches, but is only going to decide particular cases and controversies. We then talked about the case or controversy requirement and the idea of standing. And we noted that the standing requirement can be a constitutional standing requirement or a prudential standing requirement. And we said that standing is something that shows uh, this basic principle against giving advisory opinions. This establishes uh, a, a place that establishes what the court's role is at, in providing remedies to, to individuals who have suffered particular harms as opposed, opposed to other governmental functions that are really handled in other branches. We then talked about the specifics of the constitutional requirements for standing and of prudential standing. And for constitutional standing, we talked about the Lujan case and, and some other cases, and we noted the, the three-part test with a variety of other sort of subparts from the Lujan court that we're going to need to apply. And of course, as we said in class, everyone really ought to pretty easily know the test. The question is, the trick is really how to apply it, and that's where the interesting ambiguities come in. We talked about prudential standing and we said there are just a number of, of kind of buckets or areas where courts will look at and might say, well, there's constitutional standing here, but for prudential reasons, we're not going to exercise it. We talked about claims on behalf of third parties where there's not, you know, a fiduciary relationship or something along those lines, just generalized grievances like taxpayer standing and the disputes those kinds of, of disputes raise and the idea of a plaintiff who really is not in the core zone of interest uh, of the particular case or controversy and how it, how it impacts a constitutional right. As we noted, one of the main kind of doctrinal differences between constitutional standing and prudential standing is that constitutional standing, Article 3 standing, is a constitutional issue and if standing is lacking, if that kind of standing is lacking, the court simply doesn't have jurisdiction to hear a matter whereas prudential standing is a, is a matter of prudence or judgment. The court has jurisdiction, but it's making a decision whether to hear it or not. Why does that matter? Well, how this, get char how this gets characterized is going to impact the kind of decision a trial court might make, but per perhaps even more significantly, it's going to impact the way an appellate court looks at it, because an appellate court is always going to look, and even a trial court is going to look um, on its own initiative sometimes, um, or fresh de novo at, well, do we have even jurisdiction in this case? So it can be really important as a litigant whether you're characterizing something as an issue of constitutional standing or merely of prudential standing. We then talked about some related doctrines. We talked about mootness, the idea that um, when a event has happened, whether it's a change in fact or a change in law that has rendered the concrete dispute before the court 
moot, um, there really is no longer any need for a remedy, then very often a court will decide that it's not going to hear the case anymore. We noted some exceptions to the general rule of, of mootness and uh, two of the important ones being that the matter is, is capable of repetition but evading review, um, or the question of whether conduct has been voluntarily ceased, and in fact whether it has been ceased or whether it's likely to recur again. And then we talked about ripeness, and we said uh, ripeness really relates to requests for anticipatory relief, um, where the, the case or controversy has really not matured yet, is really not ready to be heard. As an example, we gave a suit for a breach of contract before there's an actual breach. Uh, and as we noted, the, the ripeness doctrine, and I actually would say all these other doctrines, really flow from this basic ban on advisory opinions and from the, the case or controversy requirement. We then looked at the political question doctrine, and we said that courts are uh, loath to engage in giving a decision where they think the question is really a political question. Again, the court may have standing here, the, the case may be ripe, there's not a mootness problem, but the court looks at it and says, you know, I think this is the kind of thing that it's really not something a court ought to be deciding. We said there's uh, two main strands to this. One is a textual strand, so here there's something in the Constitution's text or structure itself that the court is saying suggests that the issue in the first instance is really committed to another branch and not to a court. It's not something a court's going to review. Those are relatively rare. They, they um, do occur from time to time. The more common one, we said, is prudential. So in a prudential one, uh, the court is saying there are some, there's some reason, some general structural reason that, again, although the court could hear it, although the structure, the literal text of the Constitution would suggest this is something a court could hear, we're not going to hear it. And we said there's a bunch of things that often fall in this category, things like foreign relations, uh, things where the court really doesn't have the competence to decide the issue, where some other branch of the government might have more, more competence to decide it. And we looked at Baker v. Carr and we noted that uh, Brennan's opinion in Baker v. Carr really gives us very nicely uh, sort of a six-factor test that we can use to determine whether something is a political question. And the first part of that test, as we noted, is really the textual strand. Does the text of the Constitution say something? And these other pieces are really this, this uh, ways of kind of putting some flesh on the prudential stand. And you can take some time to look at those and you'll, you'll see how that fleshes out. So uh, again, you have a standing question. You want to apply the Lujan test. Um, you have a potential political question issue. You want to apply these factors. Uh, and the factors themselves, the test for standing and the factors for political question aren't really that difficult. Uh, the trick is then fleshing it out with your analysis. All right, looking ahead to this coming week, we've got a really interesting week coming up. Uh, you should see part of the theme that we're doing in the judicial power um, relates, of course, to the separation of powers. Uh, and now as we move into, we're going to finish up kind of the judicial power. We'll talk about Bush v. Gore. Uh, on Tuesday, but then as we move into the material for next week, we're going to start to talk about other kinds of federalism concerns. And we're going to spend a couple weeks really talking about some core federalism concerns in the design of the Constitution. And by federalism, we're referring here to what is the role of the federal government in relation to the state governments. So we'll look at this sort of directly at some kind of activities that are traditionally thought of as state activities. You know, one thing we'll sort of talk about a bit is the police power. The local police power is generally thought to be a state activity. So how does that relate to, say, federal law enforcement or the military? We'll talk about some things like that. We'll, we'll talk about the Necessary and Proper Clause, and then we'll begin to talk about the Commerce Clause. So we'll do some um, sort of initial groundwork in the Commerce Clause, and you'll see there's a his really interesting historical division with Commerce Clause cases before the New Deal, and if you recall, the New Deal is is uh, President uh, Roosevelt's uh, Franklin Roosevelt's effort to kind of revitalize the national economy after the Great Depression, and that effort involves federal programs of various sorts, which really hadn't been done as extensively in that way before. Challenges to those programs, and then the way the court, the way the law reacts to those challenges. So we talk about the commerce power before the New Deal, the commerce power after the New Deal. 
uh, and then that will set us up to talk further about the commerce power uh, the week after that. So I hope you've had a good uh, restful weekend. I hope you're getting ready to prepare for next week, and I look forward to seeing you in class next week.